Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to read the whole chapter. My focus is going to be on verses 1 through 16. Philippians chapter 2. The title of the message is The Church in Toronto. The Church in Toronto. Philippians chapter 2. The Bible reads, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a serpent, servant, and was made in the likeness of sinful men. But, sorry, verse 7 again. But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yet, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But ye know the proof of him, that as a son with the Father, he hath served with me in the gospel. Him therefore I hope to send presently, so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. Yet I suppose it necessary to send unto you a path Roditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice and that I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. Uh, Father, help me. The church in Toronto, the church in Toronto is what I'm focusing on here today. And um, it, it was brought up, and, and I think we were all in agreement when kind of things came to be and came to pass. Some people may have doubted or wondered whether we are a legitimate church. And so it's an easy study. Honestly, you open up the Bible, and you find the word church, and you walk through it, and you go, yep, 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 yep. But I wanted to share it publicly, and I wanted you guys to all see and join me in this study to confirm and to affirm that sound words... Baptist Church is indeed a legitimate, bona fide, New Testament, Bible-believing church. First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15 says, The house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So here the Bible describes the church in the context of a building, in the context of a framed out house. It is the house of God. It is the church of the living God. It is the pillar and the ground of the truth. That means it's the foundation. That means it's also the support. It's the beam. It's the pillar. It's, it's what holds the very truth 
itself up. Understand that Christ is the way, the truth, the life. He embodies the truth. What is truth? Well, it was standing in front of Pilate. Amen? But what we have been given is the ministry to bear the likeness of Christ as little lights, as a body, his body, upon this earth, exhibiting ourselves as the pillar and the ground of what he embodies. The truth is what we are to be based upon. The truth is what everything that this church does has to be built thereupon. But even though the example comes as a building being the church, we all know that the church is not a building. These two are part and parcel. But often we'll tell people, hey, you should come visit our church. And if people are around this area, they usually say, oh, that one in the corner, referring to the building over there. Because all know it by the high steeple and by the cathedral-like openings and by the big doors and by the stained glass. That's a church, correct? Well, no, because the Bible says, and you can just turn the page if you wanted to or stay where you're at. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 15 is one place where the Bible says this. It says, Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphos and the church which is in his house. Here's signifying that the church is part and parcel separate to its location. It doesn't say that his house is the church. It says the church resides within the house. And you'll find that time and time and time and time again. And even as Sound Words Baptist did, you'll find many independent churches in the Old Testament, wherever their locality was and wherever they started, foundationally began within a house. The meeting place has nothing to do with the church itself. The church then is the body that resides within it. The church is separate from the structure that it meets in. And they can be scattered abroad. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use Philippians chapter 2 as kind of our framework. So you can leave a bookmark there if you want. But I'm going to be going to Acts. Because if we want to learn about the church and the foundations of the church, we need to go to the book of Acts. Because that's where it's all located. That's, that's the heart of the beginnings, the Acts of the Apostles, the foundation of the New Testament church as we know it. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, you'll find this. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. The point I'm grabbing from here is that they remained the church even while they're scattered abroad. The application is clear. We're from all different places on the countryside of southern Ontario. We travel, some of us, an hour, some of us longer to get and to reside here. Even though they were scattered abroad at this time, the Bible says, as Saul came and consented to the death and rose a great persecution against the church, it's referring to the church when it talks about them being scattered abroad. And this is how a church then can be a group of people and has nothing to do with where they reside and where they actually meet. It's another aspect of that. They can be scattered abroad and remain the church. And that's exactly what you see here in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. Saul scattered who? The church. But it's still the church at Jerusalem. It still has a, se a separate and distinct locality, though they're all moved about and tossed about as the persecution comes upon them. The next point that you'll see is in verse 3. It said, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison. Now, I don't know if this is happening too often, but you do see that the church is made up here of men and women. Those are the people that are being hailed. Those are the people that being drawn out. And so we then see an example of ourselves as Sound Words Baptist Church as a group of men and women, believers that aren't distinguished by whether they are male or whether they are female. Though distinguishedly male and female, right? So there's a secondary point where you'll see that there's none of these mixed up crazy, confused, transgender freaks and weirdos involved in the church, right? Men and women are the ones that are being hailed out. Those are the ones that are part of the church. That just came to me. Thank you, God. The church, then, is a separated body of believers, men and women alike, that though they are scattered abroad, are distinguished by the set locality where they're at. That's why we can be called the church in Toronto. We are a church in Toronto. Our locality is Toronto, and we are the believers that make up Sound Words Baptist Church. Church, then, is what was purchased with his own blood. The Bible says that the church was purchased with the blood of Christ. And as such, it kind of aligns itself with the believers on par. 
You would see that. You would recognize that when you realize that the believers are who make up the body of the church. Every believer in history was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, as far back as you can even imagine, and then some, and then multiplied by a million. The foundation of everything that we can comprehend is when Christ was the lamb slain, and his blood transcends the timing of 2,000 years ago, which we look as the actual event happening within our framework of understanding. But Christ purchased the church as believers with his own blood. And again, it's something that transcends Calvary. What's an example of that? Look across to Acts chapter 7 and verse 38. Acts chapter 7 and verse 38. Verse 37 says, This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. The church then existed in the wilderness at the time of Moses receiving the lively oracles, the Ten Commandments and beyond from God himself. That same prophet that would be raised up unto us, referring to Jesus Christ, was in that same church in the wilderness, abiding with them and giving them the lively oracles that he did. So then, therefore, you see, the church didn't just start with Christ and the apostles, but the church has always been so. How is that? And why don't you see church in the Old Testament? Well, anytime you read congregation in the Old Testament, that is referring to the church. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 12, it says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. That's the New Testament translation, or rather just a, a quoted reference to Psalm chapter 22 and verse 22. It says the same thing, but it says, instead of in the midst of the church will I sing praise, it says, in the midst of the congregation will I sing praise. And so therefore, you see, the church, the congregation, those two terms are synonymous. Therefore, you also see that it is something that transcends. Though Christ purchased with his blood, it transcends the event that actually took place. The church has always been God's vehicle for reaching the world with the truth. It had always been the pillar and the ground of the truth. Though when it comes to the New Testament, we find that exact term, church, brought to our understanding, and it becomes a little more alive to us. We need to understand that congregations of the believers have always existed. Even in the time of Moses, you'll find that he went without the camp, and that became a separate and distinct place where they would meet with God. So therefore, you had the world of the Israelites, but you also had the people that separated themselves unto the church of God, the congregation of believers. And they met separately because uh, it, it was just not meet that the whole nation would serve God, though God would have it to be so. Even as it would be meet that the whole city of Toronto would serve God, but it's not so. And so we are separated. We don't go out into the wilderness. There's not much wilderness left around here. But we have our own little wilderness, our own little space, our own little meeting house where we assemble as the church here in Toronto. Go back to Philippians, if you would. Philippians chapter 2. I'm just going to trust that everyone's got a uh, bookmark in Philippians and a bookmark in Acts, and that way I can just kind of go as fast as I need to. So the church then is the body. It is the gathering of individuals that make up what the church is. Therefore, you see, as the same way that the church existed, bud blocked by Jesus Christ transcending the actual event, so is the salvation of the believers that make up to it. It would just make sense that the church existed the same way as believers existed. And that blows apart dispensationalism. That blows apart the idea that there was a different and distinct uh, salvation because you have to take the church and the believers in the same aspect and in the New Testament they constantly refer to the Old Testament church which is the same thing it's believers that have assembled and separated themselves together so therefore as the church believers as the people were saved by the blood of Jesus Christ throughout all time so the church was bought by the blood of Jesus Christ throughout all time that we know of because he was slain from the foundation of the world. So I've taken Philippians as kind of a, a, like an outline of how we'll walk through the different characteristics and aspects specifically applying to sound words that prove without a shadow of a doubt that we are a New Testament church. We are an official congregation as if there was any doubt. First, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1 and 2. If therefore 
If, therefore, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So here the, the, the encouragement and the idea, the first point is that we are like-minded, we are of one accord, and we are of the same love. Back in Acts chapter 2, you'll find the foundations of the church being something that we ourselves here represent very fluidly and very rightly. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, the Bible says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Here it talks about a steadfastness in what? Doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. And we all do this on a regular basis. Once a week we come together. Even when we're apart, scattered abroad, we still exist as the church. And we fellowship by means that we can, right? We have now the text, the phone. We can get hold of each other. We also do it in person. Breaking of bread. This is something we love to do as a church, especially as a Baptist church. We bring food. We break bread together. Whether we're picnicking or whether we're here in the meeting place or whether we have another set time. Prayers, doctrine, we all have a common unity, a like-minded one accordness that revolves around these truths and these things. Verse 44, it says, and all that believed were together and had all things in common. We have a togetherness, a commonality, and it revolves very distinctly around the precepts of the apostles and their doctrine, the scriptures. Verse 46, the Bible continues and says, And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and in breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So those that are saved become added to the church, and that's God's doing here. But here the main point that you can grab a hold of is that there is a one accordness, a singleness of heart within the believers that we have here. And you've experienced it, and you know it to be true. You know that we're all united and we're bonded by a singleness of heart, and that is to, as it says in verse 7, 47, praising God, having the church assembled together, breaking bread, coming together in fellowship, being united under that commonality, that common goal. We have a like-mindedness. We are of one accord. We have the same love. And we too, as sound words, has that commonness. And in addition, we also see, as the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved, we saw that God has added to the church people that fit. And that's what God does. He takes those that fit, right in the body and he adds them and we've experienced that we've had people join up with us not those that were here from the beginning and kind of went away but anyone that joined up with us fit and it was god that saw it fit and it was god that made the addition and i believe that sound words holds to a like-mindedness one accord same love and that's the love of god that's that's the desire to be after his precepts back in philippians you can go back in philippians in chapter 2, and in verse 3, the next point is that esteem other better. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And we have been a church that has often, as it says in Acts chapter 12, Acts chapter 12 and verse 4 and 5, we have often sought the better for others. Acts chapter 12 and verse 4 says, And when they had apprehended him, talking about Peter, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quatrains of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth unto the people. Verse 5, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And I know that in this body, I know that in this congregation, we have believers. I am one of them that will often and periodically and throughout the day have an esteem for other in this church better than myself. When I can take an opportunity to pray for myself and my problems, and my, I often esteem other better than myself. And I know that there's people here with the same heart. We all have a, a restricted amount of time. But when you give that time for prayer of dedication unto others, that is you esteeming other better than themselves. And here they did for Peter. The group got together, the church got together and prayed without ceasing 
for him. He was actually released because of that by a miracle of God. He was kept in prison and they esteemed him and his need better and sought God in prayer. And I know that Sound Words has seen prayers made and prayers answered. And we've come together for needs that people have had. I think back to Brother Luke and his mom and, and her. I mean, it was immediate when her, 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 the scales just fell off her eyes. It was, it was instantaneous. We came together, we prayed, and it was just like, bam, miracle. We esteemed other better than ourselves. We could have came with our monetary issues. We could have came with our own health concerns. We could have came, but we banded together for a brother and his mom and saw great miracles happen. That, that's a commonality. That's a, that's a consistent trait that I've seen at this church. If you were to just turn, we were back in Philippians. Uh, 4 and verse 15. Here's another way that uh, there is an esteeming of other better than themselves. Philippians 4 and verse 15 says, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. And do you know that Sound Words Baptist, we don't often talk about, we don't often announce, but well, we've routinely given money to those that have needed. Regarding giving and receiving, this is a church that has given far and wide to help out brothers, to help out ministries. And we've received gifts and of the same, and it's almost... It's almost many fold more. As much as this church has given to help out brothers and ministries in need, we've received back gifts in ourselves. And therefore, it's another aspect, it's another indicator of the fact that we are a church that is flourishing. We are a church that is blessed and planted by the Lord God because the ministry of giving and receiving is one that comes easy to us. We've given and received amongst ourselves. We've lifted up once another, once ourselves in that area of giving and receiving that the Apostle Paul here mentions. And we've done it far and wide. You know, we've given to the other side of the world. We've given to brethren in the States. We've given. We've always been a giving church. We went far and traveled far and we gave and that's that's a great thing that's something that we need to hold on to because the apostle paul here commends those that are involved in that ministry and it seems that it's rare it's a rare thing that you would receive a gift but he says but i desire not this gift i desire fruit that they may abound to your account and this is what we grow in when we give we abound in fruit unto eternal life the next thing we've been like-minded one accord same love we esteem other better than ourselves Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, the Bible reads, Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even unto the death of the cross. Here we have obedience, humility, and servitude. As far as humility goes, constantly you'll find in the Bible it referred to as the churches of God, the churches of God, the churches of God. And we understand as Sound Words Baptist Church that there are many like us. We're not that special. There are lots of churches that we find in our locality. There's there, there's there's certain there's certain nuances that, that have made the churches around us to where they're difficult for us to in good conscience go and attend and fellowship with. But the understanding that we have is that many churches are around. We're not the only church that God has on his mind. The churches of God, the churches of God, the churches of God, all of them belong to him in humility. I myself personally accept that. This church is not my church. This church is not your church. This church is God's church, and he is free to do with it whatsoever he pleases. That's a humility. That's a humble position that we take here. Obedience, then. Acts chapter 14, if you would. Acts chapter 14 talks about the obedience that is involved in this church. Acts chapter 14. In verse 21, Acts 14, verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again unto Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom 
they believed. So here we see we are an obedient church, as was this church. And what was different and special and unique about this church is if you look at verse 23, it says, And when they had ordained them elders in every church. So this indicates that at the time that they showed up, there was elders that were not ordained specifically. There was elders that were not appointed to the specific task. The one thing that's always been great about this church, the one thing that basically is an overarching doctrine or overarching idea of obedience and being submitting, uh, being submissive, is that quite often the one that is overseeing has no distinctive power characteristic over the other. It requires that the one that is following follows and the one that is leading leads. And each need to submit themselves one to another. And I see that example played out within that context of this church. I see also that example played out within the context of this church. When I came here, I had no distinct letter of commendation that said that I was going to be the overseer of this congregation. And yet everyone understood and gradually fell into the position where I was going to lead and you were going to fall. That is a great step of obedience. You know what happens quite often in workplaces that someone will be promoted and yesterday they were on the same ground. The one that is on that same ground to the other one needs to immediately yield themselves, submit themselves one to another. Though his buddy Joe that's now the boss is the same as him. He needs to accept that he is in that lower position and yield himself and submit himself to the position that has been appointed. And I see that in the book of Acts in so many places. We know that Titus went out from church to church to church ordaining elders in every city. We see that the elders here went from Lystra to Iconium and Antioch. They confirmed the souls of the disciples, the believers that were there, exhorted them to continue in the faith. That means they were already acting in the faith when they said continue in them, correct? And when they had ordained elders and prayed with fasting, they commended them unto the Lord. In other words, the commendation, the ordination happened after the fact, but they were already believing and acting and behaving appropriately as they should in their proper roles, in their proper position. There was a leader, there was an elder present and he, though lacking in the ordination, was the leader. And the others yielded into that same thing. And that's the obedience that I've seen and, and just loved and flourished in at Sound Words. We are obedient anyway, even though we're in a position where, well, where is your letter of or, or commendation? Well, where is your proper ordination? Where's the video that shows the land on it? Where's all of these things that you need? No, they have... We have, as a church, found our proper roles and placed ourselves in our proper roles. And under the servitude of God first, we have yielded ourselves one to another and found that commonality and that common place. And this is what Sound Words Baptist embodies. And I love this about us. We all find a common ground in our own roles, right? And how it goes is God... You know, Brother Josh, in as much as he can, he can follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. And then it goes husbands, and then it goes wives, and then it goes children. And everybody here tends to see that there is an appropriateness. There is a level of authority. We all refer to those that are older than us as, as brother so-and-so or Mr. So-and-so. And we try to keep that common obedience and submission one to another full in this body. So obedience, humility, servitude is the next one. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. What a church needs and what this church has is servitude. Acts chapter 13 and verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, which was called Niger, and Lucius and Cyrene and Maan, which had been brought up with Herod to the Tetrarch and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said. And it continues on. So as these were ministering, it says, that was when the Holy Ghost came and acted in the certain way that he did. Well, what did he do? He called out specific ones and set them in front that they would be ordained to go and do a specific task. What we have is people, is believers that are set to servitude. We have a great group of people that loves to just serve others. Whether we're out serving in the streets and ministering unto people, preaching them the gospel, or whether we're here, we're made up of workers in the congregation, workers at our events, workers all around. 
And that's another great aspect that you see of any church that we hold to here at Sound Words. We're made up of workers. Whether we're preaching or teaching, whether we're ministering or helping out others, whether we're encouraging one another, we're praying one for another, we have a spirit of servitude, obedience, and humility. And that is common to any group of believers. That is common to any church that you will find in the scriptures. In Philippians again, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 9. Philippians 2 and verse 9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Christ centered and Christ founded. Sound words, church. Exalted, in verse 9, you find Christ as the head. And if you would, you can turn over to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. The Bible says in verse 22, Ephesians 1 and verse 22. It's one, one, uh, one book to the left. Ephesians 1, 22. It said, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Here referring to Christ as the head over all things to the church. Next you'll see in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 24. Ephesians 5 in verse 23 and 24. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And we have done our best to be a church that is constantly in submission unto first and foremost Jesus Christ. This is why it doesn't bother me that I don't carry certain titles because I am beneath Christ no matter where I am placed within the congregation of my peers. I am beneath Christ. And so every step of the way I desire to exalt Christ as the head of the church, as the head first and foremost of myself. And if we all have that mentality that Christ is at the head, we will move together in one accord, with one mind, with one love, because Christ is the one that's going to guide us in that direction. And I believe strongly that Soundwords is a group of believers. We are a church that gives all authority and all headship unto Christ. And it makes us weird in this world. It makes us strange. It makes us unusual. But we do our best in the context of the world that we live in, here in Toronto, here in Scarborough, here in Kitchener, here in Burlington. We do our best to always lift up Christ as the head of everything that we do. And therefore, when we come together as a church... We are in the same position, Christ as the head, exalted above all. Back in Philippians, it said the statement in verse 10, it said in verse 10, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. So the next position that you see is that it's one of worship. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, Colossians 1 and verse 18, the Bible says, and he is the head, there it is again, he is the head of the body, the church, so the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And there it is again. We give Christ by bowing ourselves to the ground preeminence in all things. And at some words we focus on, we worship, we give all of our direction as much as we can to Christ. And we try to. We try to sing Christ-driven songs. We try to sing, preach Christ-focused sermons. We try to Give all glory to Christ to the point where some people in this church even have a problem in their own conscience saying, I saved somebody, though it's biblical. We want to give Christ the glory. We want to make sure that anybody that hears us, though again, it is right to say, I saved this man. We want to make sure that everybody understands that the glory and the worship and the preeminence always goes to Jesus. And we as a body are built on that foundation. And we confess him, and we are found on that same foundation. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. That's right at the beginning of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 16 talks about how the church was built and how the church was founded. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. I'll read a few verses so I'll get started. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? 
And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But who do ye say that I am? Now he's talking specifically to the believers that made up his congregation, to his church here at the time. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Here, Christ shows forth that the rock that the church would be built upon was not Peter, though he was a little stone. It was the statement that Peter made when he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Upon that proclamation, upon that position of Christ, the Son of the living God, the very church was pillared, the very church was grounded, the very church was built upon those things. And that statement... And the Bible records that we can charge the gates of hell on that position. Verse 19 says, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So not only can we charge the gates of hell, as we do each and every time we go out and we preach the gospel door to door to door to door, pulling them out of the fire, standing this close to the gates of hell as someone is about ready to drop in. Others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating the garment even spotted by the flesh. Even as we go, we charge the gates of hell when we put up sermons online that potentially will bring flat, potentially bring argument and confrontation with those around us. Charge the gates of hell as we constantly in our personal lives go and we preach the truth unto those that don't want to hear it. We have that authority and we have that position. We have that standing only because this church is built upon thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. We have confessed we have built it upon them. Therefore, if that confession is where the church is founded, then you need to understand that because the confession is made that he is the son of the living God, it means that everybody involved here, by and large, is those that are saved. They have to be born again. They have to be saved. And so we confess Jesus, we believe in Jesus, and we are able to then charge the gates of hell from that position. But what else are we supposed to do? Verse 19 says, We are given the keys of the kingdom of heaven, the ability to bind on earth, and the ability to bind in heaven. What does that mean? We're given judgment. We're given the opportunity whereby if somebody comes and they aren't in that same confession, they aren't focused on Christ, the Son of the living God, they aren't desirous to please Him in all things, they haven't... Uh, the like-minded one accordness that this church has. They don't esteem other better than themselves. They aren't obedient. They don't have humility. They don't have a servant's heart. They, they, they don't desire to have a Christ-centered and founded life. And it, re it results in the fact that we as a church can judge and say, get out. And whatsoever is bound in earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever is loosed on earth shall be loosed in in heaven, God has given us, because of the position that we made, the ability to judge in these matters, and the ability to bring in, and the ability to bind, the bring in, the ability to cast out, and the ability to bring those in that we feel uh, are worthy, essentially, of that position, of the of the ability to meet and to congregate amongst the church. Uh, Philippians chapter two. We'll be back there. Philippians chapter two. Verse 12, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. The Bible says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And here I see that we are a group that understands that we are saved first and unto good works. And that's what the statement here is making. Someone tried to use this against me to say that you have to have good works in order to be saved. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You gotta work for your salvation. That's the complete opposite of what this scripture is saying. It says, notice, your salvation. <laughs> work out your salvation. It's personal, it's already applied, it's already received. Your salvation, 
Work it out with fear and trembling. Work from the position that you are saved first unto good works. And we know Ephesians 2, verse 8, 9, and 10 preaches that exact same thing. It's not of works. It's not of works. It's not of works. But works should follow. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But we're also a church that isn't just going to take our good works and puff ourselves up in it. The Bible says in verse 13, It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And we are a group that understands that it is God that is the foundation to even the good works that follow our very salvation. Acts chapter 16, the Bible says, Acts 16 and verse 4, this church, sound words, reflects a similar attitude and a similar heart of the church talked about in Acts chapter 16 and verse 4. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. So here as a church, the reason why we understand that it's God that worketh in us, both to will and to do of our good pleasure, is because first and foremost, we have the right gospel. We know salvation comes, and from the position of salvation, we can leap into, we can go unto the good works that ought to follow. It is from that position that we have, and it reflects the same as the church have here. They were delivered decrees to keep, which were ordained of the apostles. We were delivered decrees for to keep, which were ordained of the apostles. And what happened? So the church was established in the faith. This is a position established in the faith where you understand that your establishment and your increase, the will to work and the will to do of his good pleasure all comes from the foundation that God gave it to you. It's a faith position. It's a position that, hey God, I can't get this rottenness out of my life. I need you to. Hey God, I'm saved unto good works. Help me to get to them. And we've always been a church, I believe, in amongst us, talking to one another, that gives God the glory even in the things that we ourselves overcome it. If something goes good at my job, I give God the glory. If someone goes good at, at your job, in your family, in your life, if you see somebody saved, every Everybody in this church, as should be the case in any New Testament church, gives God the glory. Why? Because we are working our salvation. The salvation came first, and we worked from that position. Therefore, God really gets the glory in all these things. And we have always been a church that is first and foremost founded upon these precepts given in the Bible. So therefore, if we're changed by the precepts and we act upon the precepts, it's all because of the precepts that came in the first place. And we've always been a church that's full of Bereans, full of people that don't just take what's being preached from the pulpit, don't just take what they hear and, and count that for law, but they go and they search the scriptures daily to see whether those things were so. And I know this because I hear people talk once another. I hear people will say, well, I have a different take on this. Okay, I understand that. We always have scriptures scriptures to back it up. And we always say, hey, well, what about this? Well, what about that? we got different ideas about certain parts of the scripture. Hey, have you read this? What do you think about this concept? What do you think about this precept? What do you think about this judgment? And every one of us doesn't just say what we think. We say what we think the Bible says. And then that's a great position. We're a church that works out everything we do, including our salvation through him. That's where our good works. That's where our soundness comes from. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14 the Bible says, do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. We are a church that is an example of Christ, as much as we try to be. We try to be kind. We try to be tenderhearted. We try to be forgiving. We try to be patient. We try to be long-suffering. We try to love the world around us. If we didn't love the world around us, we wouldn't go out and try to reach the world around us. If we didn't love people that came and joined with us, we wouldn't go and do these things. Acts chapter 15 talks about a good spirit and a church that shines as lights. That is what sound words is. Acts chapter 15 and verse 4, the Bible says, And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. What did this church do at Antioch, or at Jerusalem rather? They received people in the church. And we are also a church, while we're made up of believers, Christ-centered believers, and, and we've, we've been known to, to have some visitors come and go, we've been known to run off some visitors. 
We are generally one that will receive them. And this is what the church here did at Jerusalem. They received the apostles as they traveled through. And that's what this church does. Sound words, and that's the example that we find in scriptures. In verse 22, the Bible says, Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. That good spirit that we have, shining as lights, being an example as we go, doesn't mean that we just bring people in and invite them or we're hospitable to them, believers and unbelievers alike, and helpful to them. It also means that we will send those of our own company. We have sent ambassadors to events. We have sent people to go and join and partake in certain things. We have sent all of us, as many as could go, down to native reserves. We have sent people down to Florida. We have sent, we've done our best to be one that gives ambassadors and sends them out that they would go and they would be a blessing to another group of people. And that's what you see in verse 22. And that's what we've done. We've been hospitable, warm, welcoming at the same time. We've also been a church that sends people out. But we know that that murmuring and that disputing spirit has also crept in here at times. And that's what it says. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. And we know that sound words over the past year has had some leave. We have had some forced out. We have some that have been marked to be avoided. And this is another mark of the church that you would have grievous wolves entered in, that you would have people that come in with murmurings and disputings. Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20 talks about a specific group. Acts chapter 20. In verse 28, Acts 20 and verse 28 says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, so, so God, I believe, founded this church that he purchased with his own blood. And he gives this same statement to me. He gives the same statement to any one of us here under the sound of my voice today. He says, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember. Therefore, watch and remember. And we have been a church that has good discernment in these areas. And the ones that remain have seen men arise up from among us, preaching perverse things, trying to draw away people after themselves. We've also seen people come in, not sparing the flock, to try to draw away disciples themselves. We've both seen the ones that come from without. We've both seen the ones that arise from within. And this is just another sign that sound words is an official bona fide, Christ-planted congregation and church. We are a good spirit, though, predominantly. We shine as lights. And as lights, when darkness comes, it's exposed very quickly. We are all those that are focused on Christ, and we've founded our lives upon them. We've come together in that same vein. We work at our salvation with fear and trembling. We esteem other better. We have obedience, humility, servitude. We are like-minded. We are of one accord as we assemble here together, and even as we're scattered abroad. The next thing that you'll see, and the last point I have, is in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 16. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 16. Another sign of the New Testament church. <clears throat> Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Sound words is a church that runs, that labors, and that rejoices to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Holding forth the word of life. This chapter in Philippians, I leaned heavily on it because it talks about the congregation coming together in one mind. It talks about the church esteeming other better than themselves. It talks about the obedience, the humility, the servitude that this body should represent and should have. Here he was specifically talking about the Philippian church. Had to be Christ-centered. Had to be founded upon him. Exalting him. Worshipping him. Confessing him and building themselves upon him. Their church that worked out their own salvation with fear and trembling had a good spirit. Shined as lights 
in the world and for, held forth the word of life, held forth the truth, charged forward with the very words of life, runs and labors to and diligently seeks that God's word would go forth and would shine amongst the sin forsaken, the sin overtaken world. And as I walked through Philippians, I began to see applications of the very verses that I had pulled out of Scripture. You type in church, and you look, and it's like, wow, that's us. Wow, that's us. Wow, that's us. And I didn't do that. Each one of us individually didn't do it. But together we come together, and we make up the body that I believe very strongly, without a doubt, that Christ planted here. And as you read and study church in the Bible, go do it yourselves. You just find, wow, that's us. Wow, that's us. Wow, that's us. Wow, that's us. And like I said, I can't stand up here and crack a whip and make you obey me. I can't stand up here and crack a whip and make you stop sinning, make you desirous to preach the gospel, make you anything. But we have each and every one of us come together in the same vein, in the same light, with the same desires, with the same position, and that we are a church. We are a body. We are a congregation of believers. Mark it. Put it down. Nail it. It's so. You can't deny it when you go through the script. Like I said, check, 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 check. And when you look at the book of Philippians, you can apply those very truths to yourself individually, but also use them as a step in the Bible. I think I've been to Philippians as, as in the last year, two or three or four times maybe even, to just highlight the fact that we as a body need to follow these precepts. And it's amazing when you see these precepts pulled out of other portions of scriptures. Apply them to what the church as a whole should be. The scriptures talking to scriptures and them coming together in unity. And then you look around and you're just like, wow, this is us. This is, this is us as a body. We are a church. We are legitimate. There is no doubt. There is no wonder. There is no curiosity. There is no thinking of maybe it's this or maybe it's that. Or maybe we, can, we have to change our name to Sound Words Fellowship or Sound Words Bible Study or something like that. No, we are a bona fide, legitimate church. And there's nothing that can take that away from us except us. If we stop following on the path of obedience and humility and servitude under Christ, we break off one of the legs of what we need to be to stand as a church. If we stop being like-minded of one accord, we stop that unity and that one same love, the continued doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, prayers one with another, if we stop doing those things, a little piece of the church puzzle comes out. If we stop esteeming one another, if we stop lifting one another up, praying for another, one another, encouraging one another, doing all of those things in a humble position in order that somebody else would get a leg up and you would take a, down, take a leg down. You know, John said he must increase and I must decrease. If we stop having that mentality, a piece of us being a church will fall away. If we stop working out our own salvation with fear and trouble, if we start to believe that maybe, maybe I need to work in order to get salvation, if we let those false doctrines and error creep in, we don't have that firm position that I am saved and I'm going to work it out with fear and trembling, and anything that I do is only because God empowers me and gives me the glory unto, and we start to get glory for ourselves, and we start to be very works-driven, and we start to de desire that other people have to come, and they have to be three to thrive, and they have to tithe, and they have to, they have to go through a 10-step program and believe all of these right things before, and, and, and it works, 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 works. If, if we start down that path, hey, we're losing part of what it is to be a church. If we lose our good spirit, we stop shining as light, if we become like us four and no more and very bitter and very dark, and we're not, we're not taking that message forward, we're not, we're not bringing in people and encouraging them and strengthening them. We, we don't have discernment so anybody can come, and we're just going to be this negative, downer mentality all the time. We lose a part of what it is to be a church. And if we continue, discontinue, holding forth that word of life, if we stop preaching the gospel, if we stop preaching the truth, if we stop trying to reach others, hey, there's a little piece of what it means to be a church that is ripped away. The only thing that can stop a church that is founded and built upon the rock of Jesus Christ, the only thing that can make that cease to be is dependent on what is built thereupon. Christ as the foundation, Christ as the pillar, Christ as the support, Christ as the very thing that we are building thereupon. That's established. That's forever. But we can destroy that. By what? By not maintaining and upholding the characteristics that you find in the New Testament regarding the church of God. It's in our hands, son, words. 
Let's continue on steadfast. Let's keep being the church that God called us to be. And uh, we'll keep trusting him step by step by step, moment by moment. And, uh, and if we do all these things, you shall never fail. The Bible promises.